you'd go to work and the work would be hard, but it was fun. You'd have a laugh, you'd mess around, you'd probably do things we shouldn't have done, but it was good fun. The post office wasn't just the place where you would work and deliver mail. You all became friends, it was like one big family. At the age of about 14 or 15, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought about being a car mechanic and all that, but my father was a postman by then, and it was a very secure job. So he said to me, you want to get yourself in the post office, you'll enjoy it, he says, and you get a decent pension at the, at the end of it. My father worked for the GPO, the post office. Uh, I had an uncle, a cousin, and a brother who all worked for the post office. And it was kind of, uh, well, that's what you're gonna do. You ain't got any qualifications. I'm not particularly uh, skilled with my hands in DIY or anything like that. So um, my dad got me an interview to join the post office as a telegram boy. I ended up working for the Royal Mail because I was applying for uh, job applications at the time. And I was successful in applying for a London Transport, British Rail, and the Post Office. And I chose the Post Office because someone very near to me said, take the Post Office, they got a nicer uniform. I was working in a sweet shop at the time. Uh, I was 17, and one day a man came into our estate and said that the Post Office are actually gonna take women on as workers and he told my dad that it's a good job and I should apply. I started working at Royal Mail because I kind of left school and fell into, I think there was just natural migration for, for girls that left school to enter into retail and I was just so bored of working in retail, you know, I'd, I'd worked in Austin Reed and there was like, you know, it was like the over 60s club and I, I looked around one day and just thought, oh God, I don't want to end up institutionalised here. And I basically went in the post office because my father worked there and he just said it was a decent job. And it was. And that was... I went in there for a year or two and that was 60 years ago. <laughs> every single conceivable people from every conceivable background you can think of worked there. And every age from 18 to... 65. The background of it was military. It was, it was a military background. When you went into the post office and you went to that training school at Belgrove, you had to call them sir and it was all very officious. I mean all the way back then you got a lot of old soldiers funnily enough because this was, what was that, 20 years after the war so. And you can normally tell when people have been in the army because they're very good at taking orders. <laughs> Post office is a bit over, or was when I was there, a bit overmanaged, you know, a bit, 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 bit like school in some ways. Yes, well, in the post office, I don't know whether this is the case now, but if you wanted to go to the toilet, and you're talking grown women and men here, right? If you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to put your hand up to go to the toilet. It was pretty much a job of dodging the governors. <laughs> you get away if you could get away with it, you got away with it. I'm not talking about anything serious, I'm not talking about thieving or anything like that. I'm just talking about sitting down playing cards and things and and someone is just hey, the boss and you don't get up and pretend you're working, you know. <laughs> pretend you were sweating. <laughs> A lot of the people that worked at Notting Hill lived in Notting Hill. At the time, Royal Mail very much wanted to recruit people that lived in the postcode area, and that was predominantly, possibly because we started at 5.30. Well, Canning Towns is right in the east end of London, in the old Docklands. Well, at the same time as they moved us, they were shutting a lot of the docks down, and a lot of the dockers were made redundant, and they came into the post office, so you had this strange mix of ex-soldiers and ex-dockers. <laughs> when you started there, they gave you a uniform which never fitted you. It was much too big. Uh, then they gave you, um, believe it or not, a towel and a chunk of soap. It was about that big. And it was green 
and that was meant to last you. Well, it did last you forever because no matter how you tried, you couldn't get a throw up on it. It was like a, it's, it's like washing your hands with a brick. <laughs> but they gave this to you. This was part of what you got, and you got these what they called the wet gear, and they they were the most uncomfortable um, sort of tarpaulin sort of stuff that you wore over you if it rained. But no, it never did. Uh, you know, because it was too uncomfortable, you'd rather go out and get wet. And that was it. They gave you uh, one pair of boots or shoes every six months. Now, they were not the nicest of shoes, I've got to say. They weren't your Armani or anything like that. They were leather, all leather, the sole, the heel. I'm sure they were worth a lot of money at the time, but they were horrible, really, because when you used to walk in them, for the first three or four weeks, they used to squeak because there's new leather. And as you walked along the floor, people could hear you coming, like, eh, eh, eh. they would squeak like that. But after, once the weather had got on them and you hit them with a hammer a bit, they softened up and uh, they were okay. It was a bit like being in the army in a way. You know, you had a uniform, you had a badge, you had a cap. And I, was a, I thought, this is my cap, which I brought along as a, just to show you what postmen and postwomen used to wear. Hey, I put it on my head. Like it, fit. it might not fit now. There's the hat you used to have to wear. One day, a uh, very hot day like today, very similar day today, I took my cap off. I'm 15 years old, not used to wearing a military style cap. I took my cap off and put it under my arm. And I'm walking along and the outdoor inspector of the Royal Mail caught me. Where's your cap? I was down on my arm. It's supposed to be on your head. And I got uh, fined four hours' pay, which was quite a, a bit, really, when you only earn three pound a week. So four hours' pay was quite a lump to be stopped. So I always wore my cap afterwards. I went for an interview and a test, quite a simple test. It's, you know, sort of like memory and. Uh, um, looking at different addresses and noticing things that were wrong. Quite a, it was quite a simple test. Um, passed the test, um, got offered a job and started about a month later. First job I did for Royal Mail, I was uselessly employed. Because you didn't have the proper training to go and do a delivery, they gave you a range of menial jobs to do which would be things like tipping the mail sacks out with the, with the mail, uh, pushing the work around to people who were more experienced that could sort the mail, uh, and, and things like that. So uh, what it said on the sign and on sheet was you were uselessly employed, right? but everybody else termed you as uselessly employed because you didn't know what you were doing. Okay, so it was ever so exciting, it wasn't really. It was working on something called the facing table. Um, it's where all the mail bags were tipped. So you collect the mail, it all goes in a grey sack, or grey, um, a beige sack back then, because it's all made out of cloth, and some of them had fleas in them, they were horrible. The facing table is a long, long table with postmen and postwomen standing either side. In the middle there's a conveyor belt, you basically tip the bags onto the table and put the letters onto the conveyor belt. Uh, and anything that was over a certain size, you put in a bit another bag. And <laughs> that's the first job I did. Because of Royal Mail's times of jobs, they've got so many different opportunities for people to work early shift, a late shift, or a night shift. It came together that I could actually carry on being a travelling motor mechanic and do the shift work at the post office. So I encompassed both jobs and that way I became a very rich person. If you had a small family it was a great, you know, it was a great balance for work and family life um, and a lot of the um, guys that I worked with had small children and you know they was able to get home in time, pick the kids up from school, start the dinner why their wives went out and done their part-time or full-time job. I mean, when I first started to earn a decent living, you had to earn a lot of overtime. Um, so that you'd be there from early in the morning to late at night. And it was very, you know, tiring. 
It's very tiring. Um, but that's, you know, if you wanted to pay your mortgage or pay your rent and have a holiday, you had to work these long hours. When I was a telegram boy, they used to call them young postmen at the time. I started in Victoria in South West One, and uh, there were about 30 or 40 uh, fellas between the age of 16 and 18. And we had to uh, learn the routes. So you got a week's training. There were five routes that you, you had to learn, and you got taken out. Three of those routes you did on a bicycle. Two of them you used to walk. Very, very nervous because I was the only girl. So I was the first telegram girl in South Kensington. So I was with all these young boys because we were all 17. So when you're a telegram, you're 17. When you're a postman, you're 18. So, and it went round the office and it went round other offices that a girl had joined. So all the people in the other offices were driving up to see who this girl was and it was me. We were allocated a bike. If you were lucky, you got one where the brakes worked. If you weren't lucky, you had to try and sort it out yourself. One of, one of the kids there was allocated, uh, well, it was a, a, allocated, it was a question, does anybody know anything about bikes? If someone put their hand up, they would then become the bike boy. So it was their job to fix the bikes. The telegram people were called moppers, but I don't know why. Probably messages on push bikes or something like that, I don't know. Before um, texting and emails, someone would like to say, send a message to you. So they would ring up the post office and then they would say what they wanted to say. And it would say, hi, how are you? Need to meet at this time or date. And then the people in the office would tap it all up and then it would come out on a long, 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 long strip of paper, all thin. And then they would cut it and they would stick it on a card. Put that in an envelope, fix it in a tube and send this tube, boom, it used to be powered by air, down and it used to come into the into the office where we were, the, what they called the sending out room. First of all, you you have to lay them in, so you so you don't go back on yourself. If you've got six telegrams, you lay them in from the nearest to the furthest, and then we would get on a bike, put it in our bag, and drive it up to people and knock on the door, and uh, give them the telegram. And if it's if it was someone who had died, there would be a black cross in the corner. So you would knock on the door and say, "It's sad news. Is somebody with you?" Delivering a telegram that had sad news, and see somebody get quite upset over it. I had one lady faint in front of me, holding her little child, and I was only 15. And imagine, and I didn't have a mobile phone, so. Um, I had to rush next door and get a neighbour to come and help me with this lady that had collapsed with the bad news. Every Tuesday, without fail, you used to go to Harrods, pick up a package and take it to Eton College, which is in Windsor. And you used to get, there was a thing called the Green Line Bus. You used to stop at Buckingham Palace Road. You got on, picked it up from Harrods, go to Buckingham Palace Road, get on the Green Line and you, <laughs> they obviously paid your fares before you went and you went all the way out to Windsor, delivered the package, and then come back. Obviously, before you came back, you might sit and have a sandwich and a drink in, in Windsor. Basically, that was your whole day done. Lovely trip out to Windsor. What a day's work. I, I did work um, later on uh, as a telegram boy in Buckingham Palace. I was a postman in there, a young postman. And um, my favorite was to we used to deliver to the Queen's apartments, to the Duke of Edinburgh's apartments, and Prince Charles and Princess Anne. Now, Princess Anne was a friendly, friendly little girl. Then she was about, I think, around about five or six, and she used to show me her new dollies. And I was sitting there talking to her, and suddenly out came one of the Queen's corgis, and they're quite vicious, chased me down the corridor and uh, I really ran faster than um, Roger Bannister's four minute mile to get the, to escape from this dog. The atmosphere was great. It was joking, banter, always people was having a laugh and it was it was a it was a joy to go to work. I 
I started by going to uh, a school down King's Cross where we had to uh, learn sorting, uh, learn how to tie bags, how to lift bags properly, and we'd done that for two weeks. They used to teach you how to empty pillar boxes and how to make deliveries, how to deliver properly without dogs biting your hand off, that sort of thing. When you went onto the post, you had to have a, it was a big sorting frame and you had to put all these uh, cards that were pretend, they had pretend addresses, and you had to go through and go, right, well, that goes in SW1, SW2, SW, that goes to Scotland, that goes, and you had to do it in quite a quick time. First thing you had to do, a bit like a cabbie, you had to learn all the streets in your, in your postcode. In West One, there's 400 streets. So the first thing you had to do, you had to do that for five, uh, five I can't remember, it was a, three days or five days. And then you did a test at the end of it. And if you, if you got more than three wrong, that was the end of your post office career. We then started to learn about the different countries in the world. And we had to learn places in those countries. So as we knew if a parcel come in for San Francisco, we knew that went to the USA. If a parcel come in for Montreal, we knew it went to Canada and, and so forth. Skills, memory. You need, a, you need a good memory, but they did provide people like myself with a thing called the idiot board. That's where it is. We, if we didn't know the um, postcode of a place, we had to look to the idiot board, find it, and we threw it off. Idiot board. So you could imagine, I use it often. <laughs> In its day, Mount Pleasant was handling 24 million items a week. That's a lot of mail, uh, parcels and letters, Christmas cards from all over the world. You got to remember, yeah, there was no machines to stamp the mail, so we had to do it by hand. So you could imagine the size of the workforce. You had to have a huge workforce because everything had to be manually done. The office, there was about 1,300 people work there on diff three shifts. It was to open 24 hours a day, six days a week. Yes, it was quite noisy um, for most of the time, but then there were quiet times when you were waiting for a collection to come in. So I would go out, go to the post box. I was called a buck, so because I didn't drive. So the person that drive was the driver. The person that was next to me was called a buck. So I would jump out, unlock all the post bags, put the bags in the back, and then we would drive back. We would tick a pit on a massive big table and everyone would be there. Uh, the collection would come in, massive vans coming from all over the West Central area, coming into the entrance. It was all done at high speed. They'd screech in, they'd put it on the bank, the, the chain would start up, they'd, they'd, other people would attach it to the chain, and the chain made it fantastic. You know, it was quite noisy, and that went all around the building, dropping bags off at particular points. And then you'd sort it all out into letters and things, and then there'd be a big conveyor belt that come down, and then all the parcels would come down this end, and then I would sort parcels with other people, put them into bags, and they would be going to Scotland, Ireland, England, America, down that end. Because it comes in in bulk, and then you have to divide it down into towns, or areas of towns, or, and then save something coming to London. But if you put it in the area of London you're going to, then that would go to another department, and then that department will put that into streets. But you did your job. We used to say talk and sort. You couldn't sit next to somebody because quite uh, you were all lined up in, in bays of. You couldn't just sit there chatting to someone about football if you weren't doing the work. And the, and you'd have supervisors walking round, and they used to say some some people were a bit more chatty, a bit like me. Talk and sort. Depending on the time of year, some of the workload could be very heavy. Um, Christmas, there's lots of stuff coming from all over the world. It all ended up in Mount Pleasant. It all ended up in piles and piles of parcels, all coming from Greenland, from a man called Santa Claus. Or... One time, one of the guys beside me was opening a box and then he stopped because the box moved. I said, what's that? He said, he doesn't know. And then the box moved again. So he stopped up, uh, trying to undo it. And when he read what was on the declaration, the customs declaration, it had a rare snake in it, and the snake woke up. On each sorting floor, 
you had banks of machines. You had the coding desks where the operator would read the letter, the address, you type in a postcode and it would print phosphor dots on it. And then another bank of sorting machines that would read those dots and sort the letters. To stamp the letters through the machine, you had to run them through the machine. So I was doing that sometimes, running through them to cancel out the stamps. It's all done by machine now. But then you, back in those days, you just ran it through the machine and that was good, apart from the times it got jammed, which was all the time. <laughs> you run it through the machine, you think, no, that's fine, and then it's jammed again, so you had to call for someone to help you and always pulling out the letters. Well, as I say, it was, it was mainly uh, fairly physical work. The bags were about 23 kilos heavy, um, and you had to pick them up and you had to put them on what they called brutes and they would be pulled around the office by a small tractor, like a, a golf cart, but it was a bit more stronger than a golf cart. And you would pull the things around, take them out to the containers to be loaded or to another platform where they'd be loaded onto lorries. What I called my favorite job was working on the platform offloading the lorries. Because as soon as you finish, they had a thing in those days called job and knock, right? You finish doing all your work, bye bye, you're gone. And that, that was allowed, but as long as you finish. We would work in a gang and uh, you'd get in about seven o'clock and you'd start working and you'd start loading up the things that you had to load up. Then once you got to dinner time, we used to then, some of them, half of them would go home. We would, uh, and then the other half would stay and they would have to load the containers with only half the gang because you, you've let half of your mates go home. And sometimes people used to say, this is too hard. You might say to the governor who was out there working, there's only four of us, we can't load this 40 footer with four of us. And he would, he would remind us, there's not four of you, there's eight of you. I don't know where the other four are, but you do. So we would have to shut up and say, OK, because the next day we would go home at dinner time. The rail floor was called that because all the sorters used to sort letters to all over the country. And they used to tie, they used to do a dispatch, tie the, tie the letters up in bundles, in a bag, down the chutes, onto a lot of mail vans that were waiting downstairs and they used to take them all to the various railway stations all over the country. Well, the travelling post office is where you, the mail from, say, Mount Pleasant. We used to take it down to Euston, King's Cross, St Pancras, uh, Paddington, and they, they put it, load it on the, on the train and during the night, the postman on there would sort the letters and that was, the, that was called the TPO. Travelling post office. This is the night mail crossing the border, bringing the cheque and the postal order. Letters for the rich, letters for the poor. The shop at the corner of the girl next door. Pulling up, B took a steady climb. The gradients against her, but she's on time. cotton grass and moorland boulder shoveling white steam over her shoulder snorting noisily as she passes silent miles of wind-bent grasses birds turn their heads as she approaches stare from the bushes at her blank-faced coaches sheep dogs cannot turn her course they slumber on with paws across in the farm she passes no one wakes but a jug in a bedroom gently shakes Mail Rail is the post office's own underground railway in London and it opened in 1927. And the idea was a mail, a letter could be taken from say Mount Pleasant, central London. And if it say it had to catch a train in Paddington to go to the north of the country, they could send it down to the railway, down a chute in a mail bag, labelled up, they throw it on the train, gently. <laughs> the train would then head off and 20 minutes later, it would arrive at Pannington. They take, take the uh, mailbag off, it would go up 
in a, a, an elevator to the platform because we were underground Pannington station. It'd go out and it would be thrown onto the train and off it would whiz up the country. Oh, well, on the Marrow of course, we were looking after the first ever driverless automatic train system in the world. The trains had to keep moving. On each platform, if you stood on the platform, a train would come in every six minutes for you to either take mail, you could read the label, take the mail off if it was for your station or put mail on if you had mail from another state for another station. And so you'd have maybe 18, maybe 25 trains going around in a big circle because the railway, post office rail was a big circle, all going around following one another's tails. So the, what he used to do is he used to dare one another and they used to climb into it, right? Usually when they were drunk and they would travel the railway from Paddington to Whitechapel, which was a very dangerous thing to do. And when people came out the other end, some of them had, some, some of them had to go to the hospital, they were battered, right? From the thing bashing up and down all the ways along. If a train stopped on the station, for some reason it wouldn't leave, it was automatic. Right? All the trains behind it wouldn't move. So eventually, all the trains across London on the post office railway would stop. If it broke down, we had to run out and fix it very quickly. That, that, so we were there all of the time, just waiting for it to break down. So you had a lot of pressure. And what they would say after about 10 or 15 minutes, do we need to move the work, the mail, to the vans? Which means they have to get a fleet of vans ready to go to all the offices, all the drivers. They'd have to tell, all the, tell them all the work's going to be coming on the land loading platforms from vans instead of off of the railway. So it was a big call if they said, can you fix it? And I used to get in at six o'clock in the morning. Um, and I used to prep my walk, prepare it. So basically all your letters were in a big pile of it all mixed up. Then you had to sort it. So I'd come in in the morning, I'd clear all the number 26 boxes, which was for my round. I'd take it to my workstation. And on my workstation was an RM2000 frame, they call those. So it's pretty much the streets with all the numbers with fillets in. So you could, put, you could sort the mail into the street and the door numbers. You had to set them in, make sure that you had number one, two, three, four, five. So, so once you got out, you weren't fiddling through your letters and everything. Um, and then go out on delivery, uh, normally by bus or a van used to take you. Um, I used to do that because there used to be two deliveries, first and second. I used to do that, get back for breakfast about half nine and then used to sort the second delivery up and go out on the second delivery, finish about two o'clock, something like that. It's a very manual job um, working in deliveries. You know, it's not the same as working in a mouse centre where you're sat and you're sorting all day or distribution where you're driving and you know, you're just emptying boxes and pushing yorks. You're physically carrying stuff, you're you know, up and down terrains and you know, it is a physically demanding job and you can see that with the wear and tear of postmen. A lot of postmen suffer with their hips, knees, you know, um, feet. When I first applied for the job, they said, can you ride a bicycle? And I said, yes. He was like, here's your bicycle. <laughs> um, off you go. And I was thinking, oh, I can't, I don't know how to ride a bicycle. So I had to go take it to the park and learn how to ride in one afternoon. One Christmas, I was delivering, uh, I was doing parcel delivery and I came into um, the sorting office and on my sorting table, I saw a goose. Um, a, not a live goose. I didn't have to walk it to the step, no. Um, so basically, um, somebody sent a goose through the post for the person to have for their Christmas dinner rather than turkey. Um, but I, I saw the, the goose's legs and it had a string on it with a big label with a lot of stamps on one side and the address on the other. So I literally had to go up to this door in Ealing and say, here we are. Oh, thank you, I'll be expecting that. You got the job, right, on your seniority. If, say, for example, you got 20 delivery walks and the best one is Grays and Road, yeah? Well, the person who was there the longest got the first pick. If he wanted Grays and Road, he would get Grays and Road. So the longer you were there, the better it got. No, but a good walk would be 
something you could finish in an hour and a half, and a bad walk would be something you couldn't finish in about two and a half hours. I think estates it, it, with no lifts, like the, 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 the posh blocks where you're up and down the stairs, because, um, and a good walk would be one level. But you'd have a lot more work, but it'd all be on one level. So you'd be walking right the way up one street and round and things. And it was before trolleys, so you always had, you carried it. People can be on their walk, which is where they deliver their letters. You could be on there for 20 years. Tom Smith was great on Holland Park. If he just had a name, he knew where that person lived. And that's because you had the same postman on the same round for so long. So the intelligence that you got by being on the same round around your customers, you know, who are the people you need to check, out, check in on, you know, if, if there was a parcel or a letter that wasn't written properly, they would just look at the name and go, yeah, I know where they live. And does it even, you know, they live in the basement and such and such. When you're on a, a route, on a particular round for a long time, you get to know all, all of your customers. And, and again, there's a, a little story I'm reminded of, of um, a little old lady uh, that I was delivering to, and it would have been in the, the late 90s. And um, it was Christmas, and uh, all I've heard is, um, Posty, can you come back, please? And I thought, oh, no, what have I done? Have I delivered the wrong parcel or wrong letter or something like that? And I've gone back to the door, and she's given me a, what we call a Christmas tip. So people tip us at Christmas and say thank you for all the work that we've done over the year. And the tip was a plate. And I thought, well, it might be, you know, a bit of money, <laughs> a card, <laughs> yeah, a bottle of wine or something. But it was a dining plate in a plastic carrier bag. And I looked at it and I was, thank you very much. <laughs> Didn't really know what I was going to do with this plate, but it just sh showed even people that hadn't got a lot of money appreciate what the postal, postal workers do. I had other customers that liked you to knock the door to say hello, just to, you know, like to have a bit of social interaction. Other customers would wait for you to come along because you was, you know, it's probably the only person they spoke to that day. So, you know, it's, you're a public service, you're working with the public. But if you're a sociable person like me, it was quite, I, I look forward to it. It took me ages though, because, you know, I, I do tend to talk a lot. <laughs> Briefly, I started as I told you, a telegram boy. Then I went as a young postman in Buckingham Palace took an exam to go on the post office counters that was selling stamps, licenses, um, premium bonds, post office savings bank, dealing with the public. Before the office opened, you had to come in with the keys and open up and make sure there was no bandits there in case someone was trying to rob the place. And then you'd get your till out and with your date stamp. Um, and then you, if you hadn't got any money, um, you had to put a, um, a, an order into the manager to get your money. When I started, it was all uh, uh, manual work with a pencil and a pen and, a, 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 you know, on a paper. So we had no computers. And I remember the day when we first saw that screen in front of us and we, we were so amazed that we could touch it and it could work. So it was a touch screen. It was amazing when we have that. You know, we were so scared to touch a cable because we didn't want to do anything wrong. I'm not touching it. Everybody was like that. I am not touching it. So we had to call the help. And what do we do now? And in those days, we didn't have a single queue. People came queued up in front of everybody. So if you were quick, you'd get a lot more customers. Um, and if they were slow, you'd see them coming from the back of one queue onto your queue. Yes, the pension day was either uh, Mondays or Thursdays, and it, they, they, then it, all it was giving, giving, giving the money. Eighty-seven pounds, fifty-four pounds. We knew it. Eighty-seven. So basically, we had fifty, twenty pence coin hopper. We called it. We had the coins. This is the person for the uh, passport. This person for pension, obviously because of the age. Um, yeah, gyro pen because the gyro people had checks in their hands fanning them with a gyro pen because it was a hot day inside. We, when we used to pay pensions, which was Thursdays, and the child benefit, uh, mums and dads used to come in for the child benefits, we used to have a race to see who could do the most. Our objective was to get rid of the customers as quickly as possible because then we could make some time. 
and then we could go upstairs and have a game of darts. And we used to have a little bit longer than what we were supposed to have for a quarter of an hour break. But we, when we were on the counter, we used to, they used to say crash and bash and get rid of the customers, but nicely. The post office wasn't just the place where you would work and deliver mail. You also, they also had a lot of social stuff. You, you all became friends. It was like one big family. You name it, in Mount Pleasant, you could do it. From playing darts to growing, to growing plants to making wine to playing billiards. When I first started there, they had a horticultural society, which people had their allotments and they, they used to bring in I used to bring in carrots <laughs> and cabbages and put them on the table and the postmaster would come round and judge them. I was in a post office camera club because I'm a keen photographer. I also did a bit of snooker, played snooker for the post office and a bit of cycle racing for the post office, time trials etc. Like with the football, they would let you go early. It could be up to about three hours before your duty finishes and we'd go and play football for the office. That was exciting, because most of the guys were from the East End, and they loved their football, they also loved their fighting. So some of our games did not finish. I think I've sold them all now, uh, but they had big sporting venues, so if you played cricket, you'd be at a place called Swakeley's, which was owned by the post office. Uh, you had a library where some, some people used to go and sit and read. You also had a shop there where uh, it was run by the Sports Association and they sold, I don't know why they sold it, but huge jars of pickled eggs, pickled onions, red cabbage and various other things. Ma massive jars this big. Uh, that, and they sold sweets, loads of sweets and cigarettes. Um, the union and, and all the other post office, you would take a little bit of your wage because we couldn't afford to go on holiday in them days. So when you got your, your, your money, you would put, say, three pound away a week. And then when they would book a big aeroplane and you'd all go off to America. So I was lucky to take my children to America, but I wouldn't have been able to afford it otherwise. When I first went into the office, we had our own bar in the post office. Lots of post offices at the time big post offices, they had their own bar. Often there's stories of wives rocking up demanding the salary before their husbands drink it all in the post office bar. <laughs> Christmas time, we had parties. All the different areas would have a party. And the last party of each year was the West Indian guys would put their money together and we had a party in the table tennis room. Everybody was invited and it's the one time you got to see the management, the very top in the office, let their hair down and they did let their hair down. I was working all men, all men um, and one day they said that they, they wanted to go, they had a thing called the Beano and a Beano is when all men go on a coach together down to the seaside and all women go on a coach but because I was the only woman they said I couldn't come because it was just the men. What happened, when you had two deliveries, you used to go and do your first delivery, and then when you got back, you'd all be in the canteen together for an hour, maybe an hour and a half, until you went on your second delivery. So you had time to have a chat, game of cards, the camaraderie was there. Once you went to one delivery, you didn't all come back. So once you went out, you were out, and then you finished on the road, you didn't possibly see people until the next morning. So that changed the, the social side of the job vastly. Well, the world was different. So there, there was, I suppose, discrimination. Uh, discrimination against women, discrimination against people of colour. I've always believed in handling any problem myself not going and running to the management. Times have changed in society, in the country, so things are done differently now. But in those days, you, you dealt with it yourself. 
And I, I believed on many occasions I heard those people being uh, racially abused. Yeah, I did. I, on a, a couple of occasions, I actually intervened when I heard it being said, the words being spoken to people that I thought weren't right. And the managers took no notice, didn't do anything about it, and I didn't like it, to be perfectly honest. But I think it was something wrongly was accepted as the norm. And I didn't like that, I've got to be honest. There was a guy from somewhere up north, okay? And he had not worked with black or Asian guys at all. He had no dealings with them. A governor told him, go and work over there with those two guys. He turned to the governor and said, I don't work with blacks. And the governor said, okay. He sent him to work elsewhere. And it got wrong. Now, most of the black guys, white guys, Asian guys in the office know each other. They go drinking together. Some of them actually go parties to get with each other. So they weren't too happy about that. I mean, I remember a time no manager, no manager was of an ethnic background. And that all began to change in the 1990s. And then, you know, it might not be the most appropriate word because I don't know what the word might be, but there was kind of an explosion of um, change in the, in the post office. And all of a sudden, um, you had managers, um, uh, you know, West Indian background, African background, and, um, and they went on to prove the point, yeah? Yeah, it's about ability, isn't it? It's not about where you come from, or, you know, or what colour you are. There wasn't a lot of women worked in the post office back then because the labour was very manual. As I said previously, there wasn't any machines. But there was women that worked there. And, um, and before the days of equality, um, the, the, the women that worked in the post office got paid less than the men. There was a perception that a woman couldn't do the job. There was always, a, and I think that was because women were always in mouse centres. If you were looking at the delivery, there was a perception by the men that women couldn't do this job. It's too, it's too tough. But as I said, I'm one of these people. You tell me I can't do something, I will prove to you. Whether it kills me, I will prove I can do it. And then when I was a postwoman, I was the only postwoman with a hundred men and me. And in those days, um, there wasn't a restroom for women because it was all men. Um, and the only difference was that men carried a heavier weight in the bag. I think I carried 30 pound and the men carried 35. But I think that was the only difference. I had a lot of discrimination because, as I say, I was the only woman in there. Um, and, you know, in them days, um, people thought it was all right to be, they thought they were funny and things like that. And there wasn't really any backup. So if someone was insulting or offensive, it would, you didn't really say. And I just think, you know, people thought it was banter and people thought it was funny, but it was hurtful. This is the most difficult thing about my work was because there wasn't too many women there. I kept getting um, the men asking me naughty questions, but that doesn't happen anymore, which is a good thing because they will be in a lot of trouble and they might get a black eye. <laughs> so I had no clue about what a trade union was. So my uncle said, have you joined the trade union, uh, the CWU? And I was like, what's that? And he was like, trade union. I was like, what do they do? He's going, join them, because if you get into trouble, you'll need them. A lot of the conditions we've got is because of not me, but generations before me. And the union's been involved in the post office and the GPO when it was a civil service for 100 years plus. The post office, had a very good relationship with the union. Instead of all, and instead of always battling against each other, it was possible for the union to talk to the management, tell them what the problems were, and agree together what a good solution might be. The post office is a very good employer, and our pension scheme is excellent. That's why I was lucky enough to retire when I did. And you can say that that's due to the union. If it wasn't for the union, through the years pushing for these things, we wouldn't have them. And that's true of many jobs. When I first went in, it was 44 and a half hours a week. 
So now it's down to about, I think it's about 30 something. Uh, we have, for wages, we had to go on strike to get better wages. So that's what, that's what the union done for the, for the, the workers. I tell you this, Royal Mail, what we, we, we are on skilled job. Okay, all right, you need a bit of a memory to deal with the letters and be able to sort them fast. It's an unskilled job, but the pay that you get at Royal Mail for an unskilled job, it's very hard. And that is all due to the years of going on strike and fighting for higher pay. I remember back in 1971, there was a big strike in the post office. It lasted seven weeks. I had at the time was still at home. My dad was on strike, my older brother was on strike, my uncle next door was on strike. There were 13 people from our street all on strike. And in those days, you were on strike, you were out on strike for seven weeks solid. No money coming in hardly, very little money. So it, it bred you into the way of thinking, well, hold on, this is, this is my path, my way. I want to be part of these people trying to protect their rights, trying to work their way into a better life for working people. At one time, you could join the post office as a messenger boy at the age of 14, <laughs> believe it or not. That's how you could, right? And you could go all the way through the ranks and become a postmaster. You could become an engineer, you could become a senior manager. Um, you, you know, th theoretically, you could become beyond the board of GPO. Gradually changed, and it became more difficult for people to, to progress through the ranks and to become a higher grade, um, because they started bringing people in from universities, recruiting them directly to certain positions uh, that previously had done, been done by people that were promoted from the lower ranks into those positions. The major change is privatisation. We've gone from being a, a public service who you put the public at the heart of your concerns, you know, the, at the heart, to a privatised service now that's looking just to drive that profit margin up at any cost. Mechanisation, the biggest change in the, in, in the office. We went from maybe 1,700 people and now they've got 700. The sorting of letters was mechanised, the coding of letters mechanised. So that's, that was the big change. When I started, most things, 99% of the work was done by hand. When I finished, over 70% of the work was done by machinery. And of course the post always wants you to get rid of people as quickly as possible because the machines were doing, their, were doing the work and they did, wouldn't have to, f have to pay out the wages. The walks are bigger, whereas your walks would be two hours, they're now five hours and there's no break and you're expected to do all this work and I, I absolutely think it's horrendous. The change that we're now going through, the change from the fact that we don't get as many letters anymore, but we get lots and lots of parcels. So we're having to change the way we do things now. Once you're around about 60, you, you're and the post office knowing that they're, they're going to shut down, they are offering early retirement to lots of people, particularly anyone over 60. So you had been tempted with £50,000, go now and we won't have to reposition you in a place, in a job where there weren't the spaces for workers, the machinery was taking over. And they keep putting the money up and up and you think, can I go, do I dare I go? And eventually I did. And that is, that's challenging, because if you've worked in one place for a long, long time like that, to turn around and say, I'm leaving is hard. When I first started, I remember my dad saying to me, well, that's a job you'll have for life. And to be fair, he, he was right, because I still had it when I took voluntary retirement at the age of 59. I could have still been there now if I'd wanted to be. So it's given me a security, it's given me confidence that my wages would be paid. It gave me confidence that if I fell down a flight of stairs and broke my arm, no one was gonna sack me. I would 
have a chance to recuperate and go back to work. So there was all those things, and it's given me an opportunity to bring up a family, put food on the table. It was never the best paid job, but never the worst paid. You felt important, you were proud to work for this, this company, and you were part of their brand. You was in the, in the community, you was trusted. It, it was great, I loved working for Automel, really did. It made me. My identity is wrapped up in the post office. It's given me the identity I have because that's what I've done for so long. I think anybody, if I reflect back on my father, people would have said, Mr. Hart was a soldier. I think if people would look at me, they would say, Mr. Hart was a postman. Every morning as true as the clock, somebody hears the postman's knock. Every morning as true as the clock, somebody hears the postman's knock. What a wonderful man the postman is as he hastens from door to door. What medley of news his hands contain for high, low, rich and poor. In many a face the joy can trace and many a grief he can see. Well, open the door to his loud rat -tat and his swift delivery. Every morning as true as the clock, somebody hears the postman's knock. Every morning as true as the clock, somebody hears the postman's knock.